All right, welcome to this video, which will examine a very, very famous speech uh, at the level of the word. That is, uh, what do the words mean? What do the paragraphs mean? What ideas uh, was Martin Luther King trying to express? What ideas were he trying to express in 1963? So uh, let's get into it. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Demonstration for. So when he's using demonstration, he's talking about a rally or a gathering of people. And there were a lot of people gathered that day. This happened to be in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, on what's called the National Mall, which is a beautiful area to walk around in. And I believe that there were like, I'm just going to say, well, hundreds of thousands of people. I'll start by saying that. Four score years ago, a great American whose symbolic, in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. He is speaking in this sentence about President Lincoln. Okay, a score, if you're talking about numbers, is 20. And so he says five score years ago, which means 5 times 20, which is 100. So the big question that you'd start to have is, well, why did he say 5 score? He could have just said 100 years, but he said 5 score years. Well, what he was doing is making you think about Lincoln's words. Lincoln himself used that term except when he used it, it was four score and something in the Gettysburg Address. The other thing that's interesting about this speech is I believe that when the Reverend Martin Luther King gave the speech, he was standing right in front of the statue of Abraham Lincoln. So if you want to think about this speech, you want to think about Abraham Lincoln who, as a president of the United States, is probably the most revered president. Revered means honored and respected. That's kind of who Abraham Lincoln is. And just to give you an idea of the design of the National Mall, I'll try to do this the correct way. And I'm doing it from memory, but I think that I'm right is that on the National Mall, we have, oh, this is not too bad, not too bad of a drawing of the Washington Monument. That's what it looks like. It's an obelisk. It's a very large pinnacle. This is the Washington Monument, to, uh, which is done in memory of our first president. But the way the mall is designed is we have the Washington Monument right here, and then there's a big uh, pool. I, I could be wrong about this, but it's a symbolic architecture. This is called the reflection pool. And uh, here, now this is, my drawing is not gonna be as good. Here is the Lincoln Memorial. It's called the Lincoln Memorial, and that's where these types of speeches for these types of events are usually given. And the Lincoln Memorial has Lincoln seated in a chair, basically with his arms coming down here, here's his legs, and here is the, the man himself right here. There's his hat. That's the best I can do for a picture of Abraham Lincoln seated in the Lincoln Memorial. Um, on the other side of the mall, 
down this way. And this whole thing is like a, I don't know if it's like two miles or a mile or something like that is the distance. Uh, here on the other side of the mall, we have the, I believe it's the U.S. Capitol. You know, the U.S. Capitol has got that dome on it. It looks kind of like, well, that's not a very good dome, but it has a dome on it. Looks like that. It's got where Congress meets. It's where laws are made. U.S. Capitol is right here. And the whole thing is designed so that Lincoln watches the government. This is how cool it is. So Lincoln is staring at something. He's staring over this pool, through the Washington Monument, and all the way to the U.S. Capitol. The idea being that Lincoln is so revered as a president, it's like he is watching what happens in Washington, where the laws are made. And throughout the course of U.S. history, some of the laws have been good and some of the laws have been bad. And the idea is that Lincoln stands guard over our democracy and our unity as he looks through the Lincoln Memorial and onto the Capitol. So, back to King's words. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Emancipation Proclamation freed Americans, specifically African Americans who were enslaved. Those, this momentous, momentous means important, decree, a decree is like a statement or a law, is a great beacon, a beacon of light, a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering justice. Okay, so now, wow, that's a statement. This momentous decree is a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as joyous daybreak to, so he's using a metaphor here about light in darkness. Light is shining in darkness. It came as joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. To be a captivity is like captured, is to be a slave, is to be in captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro is still is not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still badly crippled by the manacles. Manacles is another word for handcuffs. of segregation. Segregation is when you keep people separate. Segregate means to keep separate. And in 1963, even though slavery had been I illegal in the United States for a hundred years, there was still this idea of segregation, especially in the South, where it was basically legal to say, we're gonna have two of everything. We're gonna have the white version, and we're gonna have the version that's designed for black folks. And so they would do this with schools. They did it with public services. They did it with things like restaurants, they did it with things like drinking fountains and pools. It was okay. In a lot of places in the South, most places in the South, to have areas that said whites only. It needs to be like a sign at a place, you know, a place you might want to go to. Nice swimming pool. 100 years later, the Negro lives, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty. 
in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. Prosperity is another word for wealth and money. One hundred years later, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile. In exile is basically if you've been kicked out of somewhere. Like you can be kicked out of a country. But he says here that the African Americans were in exile in their own country. It's like they've been kicked out and separated and treated as if they deserve to be separated from everybody else. So we've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. Dramatize. Uh, dramatize, really what he's mean is he, he means he needs to help people see what's wrong. So what's his purpose? Help people see what's wrong. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory, promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. So a promissory note is basically, like he said, it's a check. A check is um, something that banks do. So now he's switched, he used this light and darkness metaphor. Now he's using a banking metaphor. And basically, if I give you a piece of paper that's a check, it has my name on it, and it says I'm going to give you 15 bucks, it's a promise that I'm going to give you 15 bucks. It's a promise that there's $15 in my bank account that you can have because I gave it to you. He's using this as a metaphor to describe the ideas that are in the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. So this here is ethos. Right, because he's saying these are the documents that have authority in our country. But he's saying that the words that were in there were a promise. Just like a, if I say I, I write you a check that says for $15, it means that there's $15 in my bank that is yours. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable. Unalienable means you cannot take them away. Unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted. Defaulted is another word from banking. Defaulting is what happens if I say that here's a check for $15, but actually there's no money in my bank. So it's like a fake check. It's like a, it's like a lie. It's a, I made you a promise and the money's not really there for you. It's obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are considered, are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, an obligation is something that you have to do. Just like if I write you a check for $15, I have to. I sign my name to it. I have to have $15 for you. America has given the Negro people a bad check. A check which has come back marked insufficient funds. We refer this as a check bouncing. The check written to African Americans in 1776, 200 years later almost, in 1963, is no good. But we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. So now he's still talking about banks, but he's talking about now it's not bankrupt. There's there's more there's there's money in there. These rights that we are deserving of, they're there. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. So we've come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand 
the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We have also come to this hallowed. Hallowed means holy. So what's holy? Democracy. Our democracy, and particularly Lincoln's place in our democracy. This hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This phrase is very famous. The fierce, so fierce is like a lion or a tiger. Fierce means strong, almost uncontrollable. Urgency means it has to happen. It must happen. It's urgent. And now. Fierce urgency of now, this moment. This time. This is no time to chain, engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take a tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Gradualism is like, oh, let's just do a little change. So, yeah, uh, let's have segregation, but let's, let's not have segregation at the drinking fountain anymore. You can still have it at school and stuff like that. Um, that would be gradualism. It's like small changes. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. So here's light and dark again. You know, Shakespeare did that. Use light and dark as a metaphor. Here we have light being identified with racial justice. and dark being identified with segregation, the separation of peoples. Now is the time, there's that now, so we head now here. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency there's urgency again. Urgency means urgent, must happen, must happen now of the moment. This sweltering summer of the Negro's legitimate discontent will not pass until there is an invigorating autumn of freedom and equality. 1963 is not an end, but a beginning. So sweltering is heat, it is so hot, you can't hardly breathe. That's what sweltering means. Summer. But summer needs to turn into fall. Invigorating fall. Invigorating is something that gives energy. Of freedom and equality. 1963 is not an end, but a beginning. Those who hope that the Negro needed to blow off steam and will now be content will have a rude awakening if the nation returns to business as usual. So my big question would be like, what is going on in the summer of 1963? Because it seems like big things are happening. And I don't know the answer to that question. But he does, and he's ref referencing it. So that would be something to investigate. There will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until tranquility is peace. In America, until the Negro is granted his citizenship rights. So rights are not things that you have to earn. Rights are things that you have. 
and he's saying that the people deserve their rights and they're not getting them. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright days errors brightness light again. Bright days of justice emerge. And that is something that I must say to my people who stand on the worn threshold which leads into the palace of justice. So the palace of justice is where we want to get to. It's like uh, it's like our it's our destination. But if you're just on the steps, destination. If you're just on the steps, you're not inside. Inside the building. So here's another metaphor. Inside the building, which is justice. In the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. So who is the we here? The, the we are those seeking their rights, which would be African Americans. We must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. So this has to do with how. If we're going to get our rights, how? Well, this is how not to do it. Don't drink from the cup. Don't fill yourself up with bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle in the high, on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protest to denigrate into physical violence. Oh, degenerate. Degenerate means to move backwards or to get worse. To get worse to physical violence. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. That's a very interesting concept, soul force. It uh, definitely resonates with Christian ideology, which is not surprising because he was a Christian and an ordained minister. The marvelous new Militancy, which has engulfed the Negro community, must not lead us to distrust all white people. For many of our white brothers, as evidenced, evidenced is just like evidence. Evidence is something that shows something. As evidenced by their presence here today, have come to realize that their destiny, their being white folks, is tied up with our destiny our being black folks. They have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably, this is a great word, inextricably, extricable, extricably, inextricably, means you cannot, it's like tied together and it cannot be untied. Inextricable means you cannot separate. I just say cannot be separated. inextricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. And as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees. Devotees are people who are devoted to something or people who believe in something. Believe in something. And in this case, they believe in civil rights. Civil rights are like the, the rights of the citizens. People, the rights of people in a civil society. This kind of has to do with being a citizen, being a part of the United States, being a, recognized as having civil rights. When will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. 
so unspeakable horrors. Definitely some pathos right there. We can never be satisfied as long as our bodies, heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. So here he's going to go into this big parallel section. So he's going to start these statements with, we cannot, we can never, and we'll see how long he continues. One, two, three paragraphs. So this is all like cannot, will not. We cannot be satisfied as long. So this is cannot gain lodgings means can't stay in hotels. Did you know that? In 1963, African American wanted to travel across the United States. Hotel, there were you couldn't stay in a hotel. Hotels were whites only. Maybe there were some hotels that were uh, available for African Americans, but most of the hotels that you'd want to stay in were whites only. And so, how can you live that way? It's really interesting to think about in the 1960s, uh, a lot of musicians, bands, were like number one hit on the radio. Everybody wanted to listen to uh, Little Richard. Uh, he was a rock and roll, boogie-woogie type of artist. He wanted to stay in a hotel while he's on tour with his band. No, oh, sleep in the car. Number one hit on the radio. Had to sleep in the car. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro in Mississippi cannot vote. Wait a minute, doesn't the 15th Amendment guarantee everybody in the United States the right to vote? After the Civil War, the Civil War was fought, hundreds of thousands of Americans died, and then the Civil War amendments were passed to the Constitution, I believe the 13th, 14th, and 15th, 13th, 14th, 15th, which basically said, this is why we fought the war, the war is over, and now we cannot pretend that African Americans are no longer human beings. They get everything. Every right should be theirs. But in Mississippi, in 1963, African Americans still couldn't vote. That's part of something that's called Jim Crow. Jim Crow laws. They had things like poll taxes. They had voter intimidation. They had tests that people had to pass in order to vote. And the rest of the text is for you to examine and understand.